Well, thank you, John, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. There were two bills at National Review and in the conservative movement, two bills. To Bill Buckley, a brilliant shooting star who lit up the sky, and Bill Rusher, a never wavering North Star uh, by which conservatives learned to chart their political course. Now, many have written about William F. Buckley, Jr., that irresistible Renaissance man, but no one until David Frisk has given us an in-depth portrait of the other bill, uh, William A. Rusher, who among his other salutary contributions played a pivotal role in the life of the National Draft Goldwater Committee. And that was critical, because if there had been no Draft Goldwater Committee, there would have been no presidential candidate Barry Goldwater in 1964. And if there had been no candidate Goldwater in 1964, there would have been no president-elect Ronald Reagan in 1980. It was Goldwater, you see, who approved Reagan's famous A Time for Choosing television address, which made Reagan a political star overnight and led to his running for governor of California and eventually president of these United States. David recounts how Bill Rusher shored up the Goldwater Committee when money ran short and spirits sagged, skillfully guided young Americans for freedom in its early chaotic days, enforced some order and discipline on the blithe spirits who ran National Review, expanded the conservative movement through the TV program, The Advocates, his newspaper column and his lectures, and championed Ronald Reagan when other conservatives were somewhat skeptical about the actor-turned-politician. Bill Rusher loved American politics, rare wines, traveling to distant lands, and National Review's effervescent editor, Bill Buckley, of whom he once said, quote, the most exasperating people in the world are so often the most beloved, and he is no exception. Now, David Frisk has captured all of this and more in this splendid overdue biography of the other Bill, Bill Rusher. Dr. Frisk is a former award-winning <coughs> reporter who received his PhD from Claremont and will be teaching this fall those lucky students at the Alexander Hamilton Center in New York. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a warm heritage welcome to Dr. David Frisk. Well, thank you, Dr. Edwards, for that wonderful introduction uh, of me and, more importantly, William Rusher. Can everyone hear all right? I suspect there's a very wide range uh, in this room of uh, familiarity and relative unfamiliarity with Bill Rusher, who was the publisher of National Review for 31 <coughs> years, almost from the beginning, and can also be said to have had a, a half-century-long career in American politics with something of a privileged ringside or front row seat. He never ran for public office, never held public office, never really founded anything on his own as a number of conservative leaders did and became identified, never controlled his own institution. He was, as I put it in my introduction to, if not us, who William Rusher National Review and the Conservative Movement, which was published by ISI Books last April. He was at the edge of the limelight. A lot of people knew very well who he was. A lot of people knew a lot less about him. But as people uh, became aware of William Rusher, they, 
and there was a general agreement among the whole fractious spectrum of American conservatism. We've seen how fractious it can be just after this unfortunate election. There was a wide agreement, libertarians, traditionalists, purists, pragmatists, that Bill Rusher really knew what he was doing. One of his great achievements was to give movement conservatives uh, from, I would say, the early 1960s right up until the 1990s, by which time he had semi-retired, more confidence than I think they otherwise would have had that there really was a conservative movement and that it really was moving, if imperfectly. We've seen in recent years a lot of um, doubts about whether the conservative movement still exists anymore. Some people even doubt whether it deserves to exist anymore, whether it's destroyed itself. Well, there, there have been people all along who have said things like that. One of the things Russia stood for most prominently and enduringly was uh, the belief that, that we conservatives all had to pull together and all had to be together and keep being together. Uh, you know, the most obvious cliche that comes to mind, and he would have put it more articulately and, and more memorably, is, is to not, not let the perfect be the enemy of the good, uh, not miss the forest for the trees. These are not the most uh, innovating or exciting sort of messages, but it's very important to have a few people at or near the top of the conservative movement's leadership who believe in and preach these things and who uh, ask people, ask their, their fellow activists and, and conservative intellectuals to remain focused on the need to win a majority of the American people and to govern. <coughs> National Review, as a very intellectual magazine throughout its existence, and I think probably even more so in its early years, the 50s and 60s, very much needed, I think, uh, Bill Buckley, managing editor Priscilla Buckley, and uh, every other major person there acknowledged that they very much needed a man just like Bill Rusher to serve as a political eyes and ears, as a political counselor, uh, as a, uh, a link between uh, National Review type people, as Rusher tended to put it to me, the intellectuals, and the practical politicians. By politicians, Rusher didn't just mean people in or aspiring to public office, but people like his good friend F. Clifton White, the mastermind of the Draft Goldwater campaign and the marshal of the Draft Goldwater campaign. White, too, was a politician, and Rusher was something of a politician. In other words, a practitioner of actual politics. Rusher placed a tremendous value on these people. And he was always uh, trying, I, I, you know, with some success, to get uh, the more philosophical conservatives, uh, a classic example, of course, being Buckley himself, to appreciate that sort of career, that sort of individual, and that sort of effort. A lot of what you'll find in the book, and uh, I'm, I'm sure some of you have read it, uh, is a good deal of back and forth between publisher Rusher, also in-house political counselor Rusher, who had the full privileges, by the way, of speaking out on any issue, officially and unofficially. By officially, I mean in the meetings they held, which could be very long and interesting. He had the full privilege of speaking out on any issue, editorial issue, uh, anything involving National Review's political position, National Review's tone, what it should cover, what's less important, so he played an editorial role, although he didn't have an official one, and they listened to him. At times, they got tired of listening to him. But remember, any time you, if you read about Russia or 
you know, if you, if you want to formulate a question about it, remember that this is another world technologically. 